On this episode, we feature a shamanic practitioner. He is a healer, a teacher, a, per, uh, a coach, teaching and healing in shamanic practices, uh, host of the Speaking with Spirit podcast. I'd like to welcome John Moore to the show. How are you doing, John? Very good. Very good. Good to be here. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, basically, uh, one of the questions I oftentimes will ask is kind of, what is your background and uh, maybe give us a sense of how you got started in, in sh shamanic healing in this this journey that you're currently on. Yeah, I'm definitely a, a weird individual. Um, my background's in technology. I have um, about 20 plus years, I'm dating myself, but 20 plus years experience in the technology field. And I came to shamanism through uh, dealing with personal health crisis. And uh, as many people do, and not knowing anything about shamanism, I learned later that the shamanic crisis is a thing. Um, and in many cultures, you have to go through some kind of crisis before you undertake shamanic training. And uh, I live up here in Maine, in the northeast of the US. And I uh, was meditating a lot. I meditated my whole life. And um, you know, one day heard this very clear voice that sounded like it was coming from outside of my head. And it said, you need to learn shamanism. And I knew nothing about shamanism. And I'm like, I live in Maine. I don't live in Peru or Mongolia or Siberia. So how is that going to work? As it turns out, there are some phenomenal shamanic teachers here in Maine. And I found my teacher and I got into um, shamanic practice just for my own sake, just for, I had no interest in working with anybody else no interest in doing healing with anybody or teaching or anything along those lines. Um, and spirit had different plans for me. And, uh, and so now I, I teach, I've done uh, almost a decade of training, maybe if I put it all together, quite a long time. Um, and uh, uh, I see clients and I write and I do podcasts and all of the things that you, you have mentioned earlier. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, kind of what currently is like your motivator drive drives you to to do this, these kind of practices to help, you know, help in healing people and, and to, to have even your podcast? Yeah, so my, my biggest motivator, my number one thing is that I, I want to live in a world where everybody is free to live out their true will to the best extent that they possibly can and by true will I mean your path like what what are you meant to do and I don't care what that is I don't care if you were meant to be uh, a painter or a great spiritual leader or doesn't matter right you know design video games whatever it is um, and so really what I do whether I'm healing people or I'm teaching people is I really try to bring people to wholeness so that they can, they can live out their life and live their, find their purpose and live through that. And when I see people and I've worked with people from, you know, all over the world, lots of different walks of life. Um, when I see somebody like the light bulb goes off, that's about the most rewarding experience I can, I can imagine other than the birth of my children. I can't think of a more emotionally rewarding experience than, than, than that. That's a good answer. Um, I read that uh, you're a black belt in martial arts. Now, is that uh, maybe practice or the discipline it takes to to get that at that level? Has is that kind of helped you in your journey? Yeah, um, definitely. Definitely, everything overlaps. Um, the discipline that is required to in in my school i think it you know it took like 10 years to get my first degree black belt um i realize it's different in a lot of different schools um and then several more years to get up to third degree which is where you get a teaching um certificate so and i have you know decades of training under my belt and you know that my my martial arts teacher always used to say the hardest part of training is getting in the car right it's getting off the couch getting in the car and you know 
I live in the Northeast, it's snowy, it's cold outside, right? Um, getting out of my warm house and going to train for three hours with people who, um, you know, are causing me physical pain and physical discomfort and, um, you know, putting up with, I never got seriously injured, but, you know, minor injuries here and there and pushing through that and being able to um, complete that practice, I think informs just about everything I do in my life, which includes, you know, my first, my first day of training in shamanism and my, during a, um, I did a, an apprenticeship, I almost quit my first day um, because it was so emotionally difficult for me. Um, it's hard. Shamanism's hard. It's not, uh, it's not all light and love. You really pull up the stuff you aren't used to looking at and, and stare it in the face. And so, um, you know, having gone through decades of martial arts training definitely helped me stay the course and, and, you know, continue continuing my studies. And of course, teaching martial arts, teaching adults in particular is a kind of a specialized skill. And having that background when it came time for me to start teaching shamanism is very is really helpful. I've been able to use some of the teaching methodologies to to teach physical skills, spiritual skills, that sort of thing. That's fascinating. You mentioned that you know, it's not all, you know, fun sham shamanism. Um, yeah. is, is it a process of just, you know, maybe pulling up some things that you need to deal with or them, them like tough emotions that maybe have been suppressed and just facing them? Is, is that, is that part of the process of, I don't know, becoming whole or being able to be a healer? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's, you know, so we all have this shadow part of ourselves, right? The place that where we hide the stuff that we don't like to look at because it's painful or it's shameful or that sort of, you know, all of those things and everybody's got that. Um, and if you don't do the work to surface that stuff and look at that stuff that's painful and shame is a type of pain, if you don't look at that stuff, um, you can do a certain amount of spiritual development. But we, what we see, in lots of different, with lots of different sort of spiritual leaders, we see these guys who start to like abuse followers or like, you know, steal money from their organization or do all of these things because yeah, they've done this, you know, tremendous amount of schooling in spirituality and gotten to a certain level of development, maybe even developed some, you know, what we might call paranormal or supernatural powers, um, but they haven't done their cleanup work. And so they're still underneath it all. They're still kind of a jerk, um, you know, and a lot of people don't understand that, that you can do one without the other. Um, you'll only get so far, but you can, you know, you can do all this Kundalini work and all this, all this stuff. And if you don't, if you don't work on your shadow material, that's going to crop up. And on top of that, you're going to have all of these abilities <laughs> that will make you even more uh, even more dangerous. It's a little bit like giving a, giving a pistol to a toddler kind of thing. That's, that's a good answer. Um, you'd mentioned earlier that you've always meditated. Um, this is a question I, I often ask a lot of, you know, my guests, because I think it's important for the listeners and it, I think it's an important practice in life. Uh, can you maybe define the importance of meditation of what it is to you and what it's done for you maybe? Yeah, um, so meditation is a hugely important thing. Um, and I just want to say that everybody can meditate. And, and I hear lots of people say, well, I can't, I can't stop my thoughts. Um, you know, congratulations, you're alive. Your thoughts don't stop when you're alive. Um, but what happens with meditation is I become less attached to my thoughts. I become less identified with my thoughts. The thoughts occur still, and I see them, I observe them, but I'm not thinking, oh, that thought, gee, I'm a horrible person, or I forgot to take out the trash or whatever. That's not me. Those thoughts aren't me. Those are occurrences that happen in time, and they come and go like clouds in the sky. What I am is the sky. I'm the sky that can observe these thoughts passing through. And that 
ability to detach from thoughts and emotions and and states and it's not to say that you shouldn't feel your emotions you should you do need to do that um but it's the close identification with those things that becomes problematic for us when i start if i have these thoughts like i'm a horrible person and i start identifying with that i'm going to act accordingly right because our beliefs are just habits our beliefs are habits of thought um so meditation allows me to transcend those habits for one thing um, and the benefits of meditation are well researched. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of research studies on different forms of meditation. Um, so, you know, it does everything from lower your blood pressure and help you deal with stress to becoming more psychologically resilient to actually making you a better person socially. So um, those those are, to me, those are side effects that are fantastic. Um, it's not the main purpose Absolutely. for me. But that's well worth it. Like any of those things is worth doing meditation for. It gives you a better understanding of self, a better understanding yeah. of, I think, a lot of things. And oftentimes you may even get answers to questions or things that you're pondering on. You know, um, that's good. And I, I think a lot of times when I talk to some people about meditation, they often say, like you said, they can't stop their thoughts. They can't disconnect. But I always tell people too, like it takes practice. Like you've got to yeah. try and you've got, you know, it takes time to get better at it. Like it's not something you're just going to be great at all of a sudden, you know? Right. There's, there's a, there's a really important lesson there. You hit on something that is so uh, that I've run into a lot. Um, you know, whether I, I've been teaching martial arts or trying to instill my, in my children, the, the importance of practicing something you want to be good at, or, you know, there, there's this, there's this idea with a lot of people that if I'm putting effort into something that I'm not good at it, and I'm never going to be good at it. Um, and that's just not true with anything. And if you look at professional basketball players, right, for example, before every game, what are they doing? They're practicing three free throws, right? They're practicing the basics. These are the best people in the world at their sport. And what are they doing? They're going back and they're practicing their basics. Why? Because they have to, because that's what makes you good. Um, so it's not that meditation, meditation can become effortless over time. Um, but yeah, you gotta, you gotta get there. And believe me when I say, and I, I'm sure you would agree that the getting there, the process, the, the doing it is worth it. It, it. it pays off. The benefits are huge for meditation. Yeah. And I think sometimes too, there's a lot to like the journey, for example, like, you know, all the, the pain and the, the practice that you did, you know, practicing to get your black belt, like there's something that said about the, just going through the journey is, is part of the, I think joy or part, just part of the experience that I think, you know, one needs to partake in. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not, um, you know, I don't fight in martial arts tournaments and I don't have, uh, I live in a crime-free area <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere. So it's not that I practice martial arts my whole life for these extrinsic reasons that, you know, yeah, it's great that I can, you know, I could defend myself if I had to, or, you know, uh, there's the exercise aspect that it's a way for me to keep in shape and that sort of thing. But the actual journey of going through and, and practicing and be and, and learning focus and learning, uh, you know, and, you know, just the, the, what we're talking about, just sticking with something for that long a period of time for no other reason than you get this intrinsic value from it um, is incredibly rewarding. It, it does like, you can't help but change who you are. Yeah, I think oftentimes I think as humans or, you know, maybe even it's a culture thing, but we're we're always, you know, wanting the end goal, but sometimes it's not it's not the end goal, it's the journey, you know. So Yeah, absolutely. And and things like um things like spirituality, for example, right? Um I will never say that I'm done. Like, I, you know, I, I know there's a lot of emphasis out there on things like ascension and levels and enlightenment and these labels that we put on um, states, right? Like spiritual or mental or whatever. 
um, states. And, and I don't want to take anything away from anyone who has achieved anything, but um, I don't I, I don't think that I will ever think I'm done. I'm done developing, you know, at least not in this lifetime, maybe 10 lifetimes down right. the road or something. But um, I just see, you know, I, I don't, I think there's a lot of spiritual bypassing that happens where people are like, oh, I'm, you know, I, I've seen this, you know, people who are like, oh, I've been meditating for two weeks and I'm upset that I still get angry when somebody cuts me off on the, on the highway. And I'm like, yeah, well, now you're angry that you're angry, right? So now, now you're going to get angry that you're angry that you're angry. And that doesn't make much sense. Like, so you're not the Buddha yet. That's okay. It's fine that you're not, you know, that you're not completely imperturbable. Um, that may be a goal that might happen to you at some point. Right. Just enjoy the journey. Just do it for the pure joy of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you talk a little bit about your podcast? Kind of let us know what it's about. And, you know, do you have, is it like, a, do you have guests on um, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. So I host a podcast. I've been doing it for about a year, I guess, um, called Speaking Spirit. Um, I do uh, I do have guests. Sometimes it's just me talking. And I realized, like, uh, that's my own kind of egoic echo chamber. <laughs> and so I do try to get uh, I do try to get guests on whenever I can. Um, and I've had some fantastic guests on. So I'm, uh, if anybody out there in your podcast land wants to, you know, wants to guest, I talk about all kinds of spiritual topics. Of course, I take a shamanic bent because that's my experience. I don't try not to talk about stuff I don't know anything whatsoever about. But if somebody were to come on who was an expert in something, I'm obviously going to, um, I'm going to ask them. And I've had, uh, I, I have had some really fantastic guests. Somebody I had recently was, a, um, she's a mindful wilderness guide. And I think that is just a really fascinating career choice. And, um, you know, uh, something I think is, uh, you don't hear too much about. So very, you know, very interesting, uh, interesting stuff. But yeah, I mean, I, I focus on lots of different spiritual topics. I try to mix it up. I try to listen to what people want to um, hear about. And then again, I only talk about thing, personally only talk about things that I have some level of expertise in. Right. And that, that guest you had just mentioned, that's, she probably has an interesting perspective on things, I would think. It may be slightly different than, you know, your average person. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I mean, for sure. And, you know, she's very focused on uh, women's health, which um, is an incredibly important topic that I can't, not being female and, and identifying as a male, I can't really speak to that too much, at least not from a firsthand perspective. So, you know, she can come on and talk about what's missing, what's missing from our lives as far as feeling really connected. And that's something that I talk a lot about as well, but she's obviously got a different, a very different perspective, um, than, than I do. So I, I love that. I love hearing people's different perspectives. And um, uh, I think we're all essentially climbing up the same mountain, but on different, you know, from on different paths. Excellent. Now, do you have uh, like a schedule for your show? Or I mean, does it come release weekly or monthly? Or um, Yeah, I mean, I try to do it weekly, but it mm -hmm. is, uh, that is not always possible. Um, I have been um, for some reason busier in my life than I have ever been in the past few weeks. Part of that is the holidays, but part of it is uh, just I have a tremendous amount of people um, contacting me for for one on one work right now. So um, so it's been it's been probably a couple weeks, but I've asked I've asked my um, I've asked my girlfriend if she would come on and co-host with me at least a couple times because I think that might motivate me. A little bit and she's super um she's super smart so she'll make me seem smart you know smart as well we can have a intelligent conversation and i don't have to you know <laughs> try to carry it all <laughs> i can i can lean on her a little right, bit but right but i've been trying to do weekly but it, it it is a little it's been a little bit irregular the past few weeks gotcha so if somebody does come to you i take it you know you're you're currently working with clients then um yeah what yeah. what is the process if someone comes to you for like a healing kind of what walk us through like a, a process yeah i mean so 
uh, people come to me with all kinds of things. Um, in the beginning of my practice, because I have a background in trauma, um, like 100% of the people who came to me came to me with trauma, particularly childhood trauma. Um, that's no longer the case. Uh, it just happened to be... Uh, just happened to be how it worked out in the beginning. So now people come to me for all kinds of reasons and they get in touch with me either through my website or email or, or you know, phone or whatever. And, um, you know, I'll talk to them a little bit over email and figure out uh, what it is they're looking for. Sometimes people are looking for something that I don't do. And um, I try to keep a network of people that I can refer to as well. And, um, and I also try to set very reasonable expectations for people. Um, you know, some people really want miraculous instantaneous healing. And if I could do that for everyone, um, I sure as heck would. Um, you know, if I had a magic wand and I could take away everybody's pain, discomfort, grief, um, trauma, I, in a heartbeat, I would, I would do that. Um, I would be much more famous than I am now, for sure. Um, but that's not always how it works. And sometimes there is miraculous healing, but um, sometimes it takes time and integration. So currently, due to the uh, pandemic, I gave up my office space uh, or months, months on end where we weren't actually allowed into the office. So I'm only working with clients virtually. But the nice thing about shamanism is it doesn't matter. Um, time and space kind of breaks down in the spiritual world a little bit. So um, distance makes no difference whatsoever. So I, I work with clients over Zoom primarily. And um, hopefully, I'm hoping in the new year to change that a little bit to start. Uh, I do miss working with people in person. I miss teaching classes in person. Um, you know, I, I've been taking students kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring, and um, which is great. I love doing that. But I also love, um, you know, teaching a class full of people as well. Yeah, I think there's something to that uh, perhaps just like a human element of you know being there face to face with somebody versus yeah. virtual yeah. um but with the pandemic and everything uh thank goodness for technology was far when it comes to zoom right. and stuff like that because it's definitely worked out um can you maybe uh share a firsthand experience with somebody that you've maybe helped and kind of a, a you know a good story where you know somebody you know yeah um i have to be a little careful because i do keep confidentiality with Absolutely. my clients so i will speak in uh uh i won't tell you where this person lives or anything like that but um we'll say not in the u.s this is a, a client that um that i worked with uh several times and this is somebody um who had been through a lot of trauma but was also a fantastic artist, like an amazing visual artist. Um, and, you know, this is somebody who came to me who had been really holding back from um, putting himself out there as an, as an artist, um, had lots of fear around, uh, you know, lots of things, but being in the public eye and, and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, anytime you're in the public eye, uh, there, there's this thing called haters, right? There are people who will hate on you, who have no idea who you are or what your message is or, or anything. They're just unhappy people. And that's how they, you know, that's how they make themselves less unhappy, I guess. I don't know. I don't quite understand the phenomena, but um, uh, this was something this person had dealt with, had gotten some threats, all kinds of stuff going on. Um, and I, you know, I worked with him over time to resolve help resolve some of the trauma and what i what i i hope that and i i i think i've gotten lots of good feedback from him um to to realize is that his what he has to share with the world the art that he has to put out there and this is really where kind of my my life mission comes in my goal to have people be be whoever they are the best of who they are and kind of put it out there is that his stuff, his art, the thing that, like, the way that he can touch people's lives is, you know, an infinite amount more important than any contribution these haters have to make to society, because all they want to do is hold people back from sharing their stuff, 
or make people feel bad about sharing their stuff or make themselves feel better because they make people feel worse or again, whatever their, whatever their point is. Um, and I got him to realize just how important his art was, not just to himself, but to the world. And, you know, I want to live in a world where there's lots of art, where there's lots of music, where there's lots of um, people doing original stuff and inventing things and creating new companies. That's the world I want to live in. That's the world I want to leave for my children. So this, this was, um, you know, well, this wasn't like a really dramatic story about, you know, some miraculous healing. Um, this really speaks to my life mission. This really speaks to where I am and the work that, that is incredibly important to me. That's excellent. And then, I mean, you kind of touched on this, I guess, with that, but, um, what are some of your future goals for your practice and for, you know, for your podcast and just in, in general, just, you know, kind of this movement or pursuit that you're on? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to continue to teach and I'm exploring uh, different ways to do that. I will always probably work with clients one-on-one because I think like, even as a teacher, it kind of keeps your edge um sharp so to speak to use a sword analogy i guess um uh because you know i run as a healer i run into new things every client like there's new stuff all the time and um if i'm going to train other healers or that sort of thing i feel like it's important for me to live in that world um but i'm working on uh i'm always working on lots of things um and so you know besides the podcast um i released an app pretty recently uh which is free and people can download that and you can listen to my podcast on the app and um get i've got a youtube channel and you can pull up the video it's basically a place that aggregates a lot of the stuff that i produce um which i think is fun and pretty cool and and being a a tech guy like i'm you know kind of nerdy that way but um Uh, I'm also working on a book, which will probably be one of uh, several or many, hopefully, books, uh, books to come. I just had a, I just had a chapter published in a a book that I contributed to that came out right before, right before Christmas, which I was kind of excited about and was published, published overseas, but, um, uh, you know, uh, what's the name of the book? It's called um, Your Well-Being. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's a cool book because it talks about different areas of well-being and there's, I think, I don't know, 30 or so different authors and um, my chapter, Luck, Lucky Me, is the first one in the book and I write about um, creating uh, deeply spiritual relationships or deep sense of spirituality in your relationships and I was really proud of that work because I think that um, well-being, sometimes we overlook our relationships as a, a really important part of our well-being, whether that be love relationships or relationships with our family, our community, our, um, you know, our, our children, all of those things are extremely important. And um, so I was really happy that that uh, that chapter, which was actually meant for another book, they they pulled it into they pulled it into this book. So I was pretty pretty happy about that. That's awesome. And you mentioned the app. What's the name of the app? It's called um, Shaman World, and it's it's free. You can go to, on uh, either iOS or Android app stores and download it for free. Um, there's no advertising on it. There's not, nothing. I'm not trying to make a dime uh, from it. It's just a way for me to, um, another way for me to get material out there to, to you know, sp- spread the word, so to speak. That's, re- that's really cool. Now, you mentioned earlier that you do like house clearings and um, maybe like nature spirits and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, a really, um, a really important part of um, shamanic training, at least in my tradition, is uh, we call death and dying work, and um, it encompasses a lot of things. Um, it encompasses helping people who are going through the dying process, it encompasses uh, counseling people who may have lost somebody, 
Um, but it also encompasses helping spirits who might be having trouble crossing over. Um, so primarily, in this case, human, human beings, animals don't seem to have as much trouble as people do um, crossing over. And uh, so we would, some people might refer to these as ghosts, right? So we uh, frequently, I'm uh, called upon to do work in spaces. So it could be um, land or it could be, you know, a barn. I've worked in a, um, an inn that was a former brothel um, that had some pretty dark, uh, dark energy there, as one might imagine, um, from a seaside 19th century brothel um, uh, and houses and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, the, the thing that's a little bit different, I guess, about the way that I was taught and some people in my tradition were taught is that we treat these um, spirits as uh, clients. They're not um, like we don't exorcise spirits. We don't kick spirits out. We don't um, go to war with them or go to battle with them. If they're stuck, they're suffering because they're not where they're supposed to be. Like imagine being stuck somewhere for a century and you can't communicate with the people around you or, um, you know, at least in a way that they're they're happy about you being there. Um, so we work, you know, we work with them to get them to where they're supposed to be. And that's called um, psychopomp work, which is a Greek word that means like um, person who shuttles spirits from one place to another. So that's a really important part. And as far as um, nature spirits go, yeah, when you when you we do what's called middle world journeying, which is basically journeying in the spiritual overlay of the the world that we live in. So you know when you look around and you see your house and your property and all of these things, um, you might not realize that it's actually a fairly crowded place most of the time, and that there are spirits of place that have lived here way longer than you have. And, um, you know, your house might attract certain spirits depending on where it was built and uh, that sort of thing. So we try to make friends with those, with those I call them non-human people um, because they will look out for you if, you if you have a good relationship with them and uh, you can't really kick them out. So it's good to have a good relationship with them. That's interesting. That's perhaps something that um uh native americans perhaps have dealt with um a couple questions on that though you you had mentioned yeah. that spirits get stuck um how how in what ways could like a spirit be stuck is it just something that maybe they feel like they haven't accomplished or they missed out on in life or how how do spirits get stuck yeah, I mean, primarily it happens when the passing is sudden and unexpected. So like the result of an, or primarily, not always, um, but so the result of an accident or the result of violence um, are the two, the two biggest ones, natural disasters, um, per, you know, uh, can result in a lot of, um, you know, a lot of what we call stuck spirits, um, you know, that sort of thing, um, you know, frequently you'll find, so, or sometimes if somebody is confused when they pass away, um, you know, I've worked with spirits who were, um, you know, in sort of late stage dementia when they passed away and might have been confused about where they were. And um, so the passing was somewhat traumatic. So trauma, trauma close to the death is sort of a, a one of the big ways that people get stuck um there could be there could be a situation where there's some uncompleted business i find that that's a little bit um more rare with spirits who are actually stuck now sometimes our loved ones come back um to check in on us or to work with us on something that's um you know something that's unfinished um and i work with people quite a lot where this is the case I actually do a a weekly radio spot where people call in with their uh, dreams and very frequently when they're dreaming of a loved one, it's actually a loved one coming back to um, say, hey, you forgot about this or pay attention to this or, you know, that sort of thing. Those aren't stuck spirits. Those are those are like ancestral helpers and we all have those. Um, but they're not stuck because they can go back and forth. And and so that's a kind of a different situation. And you had mentioned that uh, animals tend to not have as much trouble 
you know, passing over as, as humans. Why do you think that is? Is it, is it our perspective? Is it our, our belief system? Is it our spirituality is not quite developed? What, what do you think that is? Um, yeah, I mean, so this is just a theory on my part. Um, but I do think it has a lot to do with our belief system. And what happens to us when we die um, is tremendously influenced by our belief system. And so um, while I am not a biblical scholar, there's a line in the Bible where uh, Jesus says something along the lines of, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Um, so in my experience with working with uh, people who are in the process of dying or who have died or whatever, um, everybody kind of goes to a place that they expect to go to. So our beliefs and expectations really uh, form a basis for what happens to us when we die. So animals don't have beliefs or expectations around death. Maybe prime, maybe primates do. I'm not sure. Um, there's there's stuff now where they're saying they they've observed um, primitive spiritual or religious or at least ceremonial practices among higher primates. So who knows what what goes on there? Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't run into a lot of um, I don't run into a lot of animal spirits. Uh, they don't seem to get stuck as much. I think it's just it's just easier. They're not clinging. They're like, okay, I'm going here now. You know, th this this sort of thing. Um, human beings, we like to cling to stuff a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting attached. that, you know, you mentioned the belief system has a lot to do with kind of where you go in the in the life after this one. Um, that kind of makes sense to me. I've, I've interviewed uh, a decent amount of people that have had NDEs and some of mm -hmm. them have actually went to like hellish places but then we're able to kind of move themselves out of that and get past that and go to a different place. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've worked, um, I've worked with a lot of people who have had NDEs as well. And um, uh, there, again, it doesn't seem there are similarities, but it doesn't seem like the experience is completely universal. Either. Right. And I have had people like, Oh yeah, I was, um, you know, fighting with what looked like a dragon to me, or, you know, this, this, um, you know, this kind of thing. And then I thought, it's not my time yet, or something along the, those lines and came back while paramedics were working on them or something along those lines. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating set of phenomena. And I have not, um, you know, when I've done psychopomp work, and, and hopefully this is uh, hopeful for some people, um, I have not experienced people going to hellish places. And so, again, I think the expectation of, oh, I'm going to hell because of X, Y, or Z, um, that that is kind of the thing that sets you up to go someplace that you don't want, that you don't want to be necessarily. Absolutely. So it is really about belief and expectation. Absolutely. Um, you when during this times when you're doing these clearings have you ever come across like something a little more sinister or kind of has like an an evil vibe to it or maybe even something that's followed you home or you know <laughs> i've been followed home a lot <laughs> um uh yeah that happens um evil is an interesting word um you know because it it's evil's kind of a human uh, a human value and and so is sinister and like we can attach that label to all kinds of things like I can think of all kinds of human activity that I would label as evil right like genocide is the, the biggest one of the biggest evils I can think of and all kinds of abuse and that sort of thing in in general I don't um, I don't run into spiritual beings who that often that specifically like take pleasure from harming other beings. Um, more times, not to say that doesn't exist, um, but it's fairly rare. More times it's um, a stuck spirit who is suffering, who may not understand that they're causing other people to suffer, or they may be 
angry or they may be defensive. Um, sometimes we, you know, we plow up the land and there's a bunch of nature spirits who live there. And then all of a sudden um, bad things start happening to people in the area. Um, you know, accidents start happening and that sort of thing. Um, is that evil? I don't know. I mean, um, we might like experience that as evil. We might experience that result as, wow, that spirit's trying to harm me, but maybe it's an act of self-defense. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know. So it is a, it is a value judgment. There are lots of non-human spirits out there and some, and some of them are not at all interested in us. Some of them are very curious about us. Um, and some of us don't want us around. And um, so might do things that we could consider um, evil. I have definitely had uh, spirits follow me home, move my stuff around. I've had stuff move um, in front of a room full of people. So I was not hallucinating, um, was not on any drugs at the time. Um, seeing objects move uh, is kind of, kind of interesting. It happens so frequently now that I don't, it doesn't really make me bat an eye too much anymore. These um, non-human spirits that you mentioned, are they are they like in another dimension or are they sh in our shared reality with us and live in like their own yes. kind of life? So the model that I use to explain this and all models are flawed, right? All, no model is perfect of anything. Um, but the model I used to explain this is if you remember the old, um, now my kids, my kids are in school and when they go to school, they have like the teachers projecting stuff up on a big monitor on the wall. But when I was in school, we had overhead projectors, right? And they had layers of plastic that the teacher would write on, or there'd be like a map and they would, you know, the light would shine through the plastic and project the map on the wall and the teacher would circle it. So for me, it is, it's like we live in this world, which is one layer. And then there are all of these layers on top of, on top of that. Some of them are really close to where we live. And when they are, um, those, the spirits that live there, um, and I like the phrase that you use, shared reality. There's a little bit of a shared reality. Sometimes they can perceive us. Sometimes we can perceive them. Another analogy I use, it's like you're in your car and you're listening to a radio station. You're tuned to, I don't know, 107, right? 107.1. I don't know what that is on the dial, but I'll say 107.1. Well, you're tuned into that. And that's the only thing you're hearing at that time. But every radio station in the world every radio signal in the world is in your car simultaneously. You are just not attuned to it. And that's a little bit what the spirit world is like as well. Uh, and so shamanically, that's we, a good analogy. Well, thanks. So shamanically, we train to tune ourselves to different, um, different realities, to different worlds, to different realms, whatever term you want to put on it. And it really is like tuning, um, you know, and you become as you train and practice and work with it you uh get more choosy about where you travel to and what you perceive and and which layers you're looking at at any given time that's fascinating um have you had any well i mean that's kind of i guess that's kind of your own paranormal experiences just doing clearings and stuff but have you had any like personal maybe one-on-ones like with an actual ghost or an entity that's like moved objects? Yeah, so um, I was in the middle of um, maybe my second year of training in shamanism. And, um, uh, you know, I was, I was still married uh, to my, uh, my daughter's mom at the time. And I would come home from training over a weekend or whatever it was, a few days. And stuff like weird stuff would start happening. And like my, uh, my wife or my kids would wake up in the middle of the night and see somebody standing at the end of the bed, staring at them and um, electronic stuff started going wonky, like all the time, like my, um, I had an old car with a, with a manual radio dial to, it wasn't digital. And it actually tuned itself while I was driving home to a different station. Um, I had my laptop disappeared and I was like, okay, like I need this for work. Like this is like, this can't be happening. Put it back. 
and I went to go take a shower. I was the only person in the house and there was a, a, a nightstand outside the shower in my bathroom and I had placed my hand on it and put something down on it. Took a shower and when I came out, my laptop was sitting there in the nightstand. It had not been in the That's room. That's freaky. It had man. not been on the table. So I went to this teacher I was training with at the time and I'm like, I got all this stuff, like my stuff's going missing. My daughter's shoes went missing inside the car. Like we hadn't opened the door. We tore the car apart. Her shoes were gone. Um, like all this weird stuff. Um, totems I had disappeared and showed up in other places. And so I was explaining this to this teacher. I'm like, oh, you know, my life's crazy right now. Everything's moving and um, stuff's disappearing and showing up in other places. And uh, my wife and kids are freaking out. And she's like, okay. She's like, I'm not sure that that's, you know, you, like these things might be happening, but that's a lot. And I think maybe some stuff or just like your kids moving stuff and and you know you didn't notice or I'm like okay you know maybe maybe I'm just not aware of it so we were training and I had all you know in shamanism we have a we bring a lot of stuff with us to training I have a drum and a notebook and all kinds of stuff and I had a rattle which we use um, ceremon ceremonially and it was about 10 feet behind me and we're sitting in a tight circle watching the teacher do some work and my rattle just starts shaking itself, like audibly, visibly shaking itself. 10 feet behind me, nobody was near it, nothing was touching it. And the woman next to me turned, you know, turned to me and said, you know, what the beep is that? I go, eh, it's my rattle. Don't worry about it. So after that, the teacher came to me, she goes, okay, that's yeah, what you're describing is actually happening. Yeah, I've I've now now I've witnessed it. I'm a personal witness, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so lo yeah, lots of paranormal experience beyond the just uh, like going out and, and working on behalf of other people. That's fascinating, man. Fascinating. Well, um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I really do appreciate you, you know, taking the time out to do this tonight. Where, where can people, you know, get a hold of you if they're looking for, you know, help? or even just check out your podcast yeah so my website or your book is, please mention yeah, your book every, too yeah every, everything uh you can find everything on my website which is um main shaman.com which is m-a-i-n-e the state s-h-a-m-a-n.com you can get the you know find the app there listen to the podcast um uh there's a link to the book there uh on amazon and all, all of that stuff all that stuff is there. Um, I do try to put a tremendous amount of information out there, so don't feel over overloaded. You can take <laughs> take a little bit at a time if you're if you're if you're interested. But I'm I'm also happy if people um, you know if people reach out to me with questions or or uh, podcast guest ideas or, or anything along those lines as well. Awesome, man. Hey, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.